Job 3 through 13. My repose is shattered, my peace destroyed. No rest for me, ever. Death has invaded my life. Job 3, verse 26. Trey lifted the tent corner and peeked inside. Four men sat in the inner area, the most hideous of them in the center. Almost naked, he lifted a piece of pottery from the floor and scraped at a huge boil on his side. Trey held his breath. He had never seen a person so grotesque. One of the men beside Job wept. It was Trey's master, Eliphaz. Trey barely recognized him. He sat on torn garments, beard scraggly, scalp covered in ash. Trey's master lifted his head to speak, but hesitated and returned his gaze to the floor. The others on either side of him sat in silence with similar looks of pain. They crept back out from the tent and lowered its corner. He had never seen so much misery in one place. As he tiptoed away, a voice croaked from within. It sounded like his master, Eliphaz. Trey scurried back to the tent and peeked in. Sure enough, it was his master speaking. Miserable Heartache Joyce and I talked for some time in my office. She had blindly made an appointment with me weeks before, not understanding how I could be helpful. She had tried several different healing methods over the years. Prayer lines, healing rooms, counseling, and other ministries. After each attempt, she would experience some measure of peace but then crash and burn weeks later. I noticed Joy's hair seemed stringy and oily in our session. Her clothes did not match, and she looked unkempt. As she avoided my eyes, her hands fluttered in constant motion. I listened to Joyce discuss what had occurred in her past and notice a pattern. Every time she left a meeting, she felt hopeful, but as the days passed, discouragement grew. In Joyce's case, an unfortunate call from her senior pastor sent her into a depressive spiral. During this conversation, the pastor informed her that she had been taken off the ministry team. His reasoning was that some of the leaders felt Joyce needed to receive more inner healing before being trusted to minister to other people. This information hurt because Joyce thought she was getting better. Now there seemed no end to her miserable heartache. After a short pause, Joyce blurted out, I wish I had never been born. Startled, I asked. Why? My parents never wanted me anyway. If I was never born, my problems would be over because they would never have started. That's an interesting assumption, I said. Why don't we ask Father God what he thinks about that? A Promise of Peace This type of statement might seem out of place, but you'd be surprised at how many Christians struggle with this thought. Losing life for the sake of comfort is not something new, but being able to deal with life circumstances in a healthy manner is key. Finding peace and applying it to our situations is God's way of living, but sometimes it feels easier said than done. Jesus warned that we might not always have circumstances the way we want them, but at least we have Him whenever necessary. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. John 14, verse 27, NIV I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. John 16, verses 33, NIV By allowing peace to flow from him, Jesus gave us an option when dealing with pain. Evangelist Billy Graham speaks to this phenomenon. The sea was beating against the rocks in huge dashing waves. The lightning was flashing, the thunder roaring, the wind was blowing. But the little bird was asleep in the crevice of the rock, 
its head serenely under its wing, sound asleep. That is peace, to be able to sleep in the storm. In Christ we are relaxed and at peace in the midst of the confusions, bewilderments, and perplexities of this life. The storm rages, but our hearts are at rest. We have found peace at last. The little bird asleep in the crevice of the rock. This is the peace we hope for that is available. The Bible promises us access to this peace, but those who struggle to take hold of it think, God, I can't deal with this pain. It's too much. In other cases, people succumb to lies like, I can't live like this. I'd rather be dead. As a co-leader of an international inner healing ministry, I hear hundreds of Christians voice this sentiment. A way out. In Matthew 14, Jesus admonished his disciples for their lack of peace during the storm. After witnessing a miracle of food multiplication, they saw Jesus crossing the lake and assumed he was a ghost. These are examples of how the enemy can steal our peace by focusing on circumstances rather than God's perspective. People use many options to find lasting peace. Some use drugs, addictions, or suicide. These are just some of the worldly options Christians are taught to avoid. A more common choice for Christians is to wish they had never been born. People usually don't come to my office until they have encountered this hopeless state. Many are not aware that their problems are spiritual, and spiritual issues cannot be fixed by simply wishing them away. As a last resort, they schedule an inner healing session and hope the ministry person will be able to hear what God has to say so they can transfer His wisdom into their spiritual bank accounts. People who usually come to me have typically heard through positive word of mouth and hope I will pray with them and discover their spiritual slip-ups so they can be healed. Many of them are desperate, willing to do anything. Job's Story Keeping this desperation in mind, let us return to Job's story. In the prologue, we see Job's livestock stolen, his children killed, and many of his servants slaughtered. According to any human being's perception, Job seems to be having a pretty bad day. As word spreads of Job's tragedy, three of his friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, leave their countries to come to his aid. I assume these are pretty close friends because people don't tend to travel long distances to visit strangers. We don't know how far each traveled or how long they stayed with Job. What the Bible does tell us is Job was covered in sores, so much so that he was barely recognizable. His friends tore their robes in misery and wept, even sitting together for days without speaking. So far, Job's friends seem pretty reliable or at least deeply sympathetic. As I read this passage in the message translation, several questions came to mind. Are Job and his friends sitting in the midst of an assembly? Or are they outside by themselves? Are they in private quarters? Or are they sitting in the midst of camp? When Job finally begins his speech, who and what is around him? It is important to remember that Job is one of the wealthiest people in all the land. We can assume he has a vast number of people living in his dominion. Most likely, there are many tents around his area with people milling about, living their lives by cooking, cleaning, and watching children. In this setting, we find a man responding in much the same way as many would today, angry, upset, and confused. His first words are similar to many discouraged clients who weep in my office, but more poetic, of course. Obliterate the day I was born. Blank out the night I was conceived. Let it be a black hole in space. May God above forget it ever happened. Erase it from the books. And why? Because it released me from my mother's womb into a life with so much trouble. Job 3, verses 3 to 4, 10. Right out of the gate, Job begs for his name to be erased from heaven. Why? 
because if he hadn't been born, he wouldn't be experiencing these problems. As I mentioned before, many Christians who suffer severe issues struggle with these same thoughts. They find themselves voicing Job's cry. Why is everything so hard? I wish I had never been born. Following this train of thought, Job stumbles onto another kernel. If life is so miserable, what is the point of even living out its existence? What's the point of life when it doesn't make sense? When God blocks all the roads to meaning? Job 3, verse 23. It's easy to forget God's promises when we are facing difficulty. We humans tend to desire a way out and try anything to resolve the issue. Like Job, we wonder what the purpose of life is, and when we don't find one, decide its entire existence is reserved for pain. At times, a friend's words or comfort can help us navigate discouragement. In other cases, they can lead us from the truth. Just as Job had friends surrounding him in difficulty, so do we tend to have companions come to our aid. Unfortunately for Job, his friends are not that helpful. They may sound logical, but their outlook of God is defined by their own knowledge and fails to bring any adequate answers to the table. Doesn't God use pain to fix us? One thread Job's friends try to push is the idea that God works all things together for good. While this statement is true, people on the receiving end of tragedy rarely ever want to hear it. So, what a blessing when God steps in and corrects you. Mind you, don't despise the discipline of Almighty God. True, He wounds, but He also dresses the wound. The same hand that hurts you heals you. Job 5, verses 17 through 18. Eliphaz basically states that Job should be grateful because God is using this time of crisis to correct him. Job may be suffering, but at least God is using it for his benefit. Meanwhile, back in my office, Joyce explains how some of her friends have said the same thing. They claim that God has allowed problems in her life so she can be aware of her issues, repent, and become whole. But when Joyce repents, she still feels condemned, unsure of what to do. She dives deeper into the mire of self-analysis. Self-analysis is exactly what Eliphaz wants Job to do. If he can get Job to reflect on and admit his sin— then maybe God will have mercy and restore his fortunes. Think, has a truly innocent person ever ended up on the scrap heap? Do genuinely upright people ever lose out in the end? It's my observation that those who plow evil and sow trouble reap evil and trouble. One breath from God and they fall apart. One blast of his anger and there's nothing left of them. Job 4, verses 7 through 9. Eliphaz's words suggest it is impossible for Job to be in the right. God is just. Therefore, why would he punish an innocent person? Eliphaz sees this as an opportunity for Job to repent and be thankful, since, after all, the Lord is improving him. Contrary to Eliphaz's assertion, Job is not feeling thankful at all. At the moment, there is not a thankful bone in his body. All Job feels is hurt, scared, and betrayed. He lets his friends know just how depressed he is. Not only has everything he loved been torn from him, but the one relationship he could depend on, the Lord, has vanished. The arrows of God Almighty are in me, poison arrows, and I'm poisoned all through. God has dumped the whole works on me. Job 6, verse 4 In this passage, we see that Job feels sick. The idea of believing God has allowed all this to happen weighs on him so heavily that he cannot pry himself from the pit. He feels God has dumped all this tragedy on him. But why? Back in my office, Joyce begs me, 
to find the root of her problem and asks why God has sent provided a way out. Like so many others experiencing tragedy, she wonders why God has placed her on this unfair path. Maybe God created her in a non-personal way? Maybe he is indifferent to suffering? Maybe God left her to fend for herself? Human life is a struggle, isn't it? It's a life sentence to hard labor. Like field hands longing for quitting time, and working stiffs with nothing to hope for but payday. I'm given a life that meanders and goes nowhere. Months of aimlessness, nights of misery. Job 7 verses 1 to 3 It's all pious bluster. Eliphaz continues his argument with Job, but is quickly interrupted. At this point, Job feels the advice is useless. He still doesn't have any reasons for why all this happened. He continues to seek the truth and refuses to give in to his friend's hot air. When desperate people give up on God Almighty, their friends, at least, should stick with them. But my brothers are fickle as a gulch in the desert. One day they're gushing with water from melting ice and snow cascading out of the mountains. But by midsummer they're dry, gullies baked dry in the sun. Job 6, verses 14 through 17. There is a hint of anger in Job's voice. I can imagine, like Joyce, that he feels angry because his friends aren't providing anything helpful. Confront me with the truth and I'll shut up. Show me where I've gone off the track. Honest words never hurt anyone. But what's the point of all this pious bluster? Job 6, verses 24 through 25. Job realizes his friend's guidance is harmful and concludes the words are untrue. He doesn't have any answers and is still not sure why such bad things have happened, but at least he can separate their poison from his truth. Still unable to connect with God, Job decides life is hopeless. He knows God is responsible because he created all things, but perhaps God doesn't take care of his creation. What are mortals, anyway, that you bother with them? That you even give them the time of day? That you check up on them every morning, looking in on them to see how they're doing? Let up on me, will you? Can't you even let me spit in peace? Even supposed I'd sinned, how would that hurt you? You're responsible for every human being. Job 7, verses 17 through 20. At this point, Job sinks deeper into discouragement. He knows there is a God, but perhaps he's not that interested in caring for humans. Bad things only happen to bad people. In the world of storytelling, we expect the good guys to win and the bad guys to lose. We enjoy it when stories end happily and feel cheated when the bad guys win. Some people dreamily expect life to follow this model, But as anyone with experience knows, sometimes life doesn't go according to plan. The lie that bad things only happen to bad people is an ancient one. Seen in the book of Job, we see Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar try to teach their friend about this concept. They don't entertain the possibility that Job is a good person who has experienced tragedy due to circumstances beyond his control. Instead, they try to ram their truths down his throat. The next friend to speak is Bildad, and he has some insight to share. In his mind, God is not the cause of his pain. God is good, and Job's experience is bad. Therefore, what Job is going through must be connected to something bad he has done. Does God mess up? Does God Almighty ever get things backward? It's plain that your children sinned against him. Otherwise, why would God have punished them? Here's what you must do, and don't put it off any longer. Get down on your knees before God Almighty. If you're as innocent and upright as you say, it's not too late. He'll come running. He'll set everything right again, reestablish your fortunes. Even though you're not much right now, 
you'll end up better than ever. Job 8, verses 3-7 through 7. Bildad's counsel starts right where Eliphaz is left off. He essentially states, none of this is God's fault because he is good. It has to be yours. Joy's friends make similar claims. She hears the voice of condemnation, as many see her as a bad person. Joyce tries to pray, but all it leads to is her feeling judged. After each attempt at prayer, she feels guilty. Turning to me, she hopes for healing. Job confronts Bildad and says he has not helped or changed anything. Instead, he waits for God's answer and opens his heart to correction. So what's new? I know all this. The question is, how can mere mortals get right with God? If we wanted to bring our case before Him, what chance would we have? Not one in a thousand. So how could I ever argue with Him, construct a defense that would influence God? Even though I'm innocent, I could never prove it. I can only throw myself on the judge's mercy. If I called on God and He Himself answered me, then, and only then, would I believe that He's heard me? Job 9, verses 2-3, to verses 14-16 through Job says that even if he tried to approach God, his case would be unheard. We might agree with Job's sentiment at this time and feel that even if he did go to the Lord for justice, nothing would change. Going to God Directly At this point, life for Job is pretty horrible. The pain he feels compounded by the poor advice, is not helping. He feels judged by everyone around him. In our lives, we might recognize times where we felt like we couldn't connect to the Lord, or perhaps we struggled with family or friends who made matters worse even when they didn't mean to. Sometimes we can be in a vulnerable place and hear something hurtful that our friends and family didn't mean. Whatever the case, Job remains a very identifiable figure because, in many ways, he represents us in our deepest, darkest moments. In the depth of his misery, Job voices his frustration at hearing condemnation from his friends. Even if I say, I'll put all this behind me, I'll look on the bright side and force a smile, all these troubles would still be like grit in my gut, since it's clear you're not going to let up. The verdict has already been handed down. Guilty. So what's the use of protests or appeals? Job 9, verses 27 through 29. Job continues his dialogue and gives an account of his innocence. He eventually decides the only option is to talk with God directly. He lets out all his frustration and begins to speak honestly. So what's this all about, anyway, this compulsion to dig up some dirt, to find some skeleton in my closet? You know good and well I'm not guilty. You also know no one can help me. Job 10, verses 6 through 7. Job's decision to talk with God is a major step towards his breakthrough. Like with any situation, hearing God's perspective can shed a glimpse into the overall circumstances. Like Joyce, Job has endured honest yet painful discussions with his family and friends. He now hopes to gain an audience with the Lord. Job's friend Zophar decides that Job has gone too far and tries to put a stop to it. He believes that no one can come to a complete revelation of God, therefore, why try to understand his ways? What a flood of words! Shouldn't we put a stop to it? Should this kind of loose talk be permitted? Job, do you think you can carry on like this and will say nothing? That we'll let you rail and mock and not step in? Do you think you can explain the mystery of God? Do you think you can diagram God Almighty? Job 11, verses 2-3, to verse 7 Zophar condemns Job's pleas to speak with God directly. In Zophar's mind, it's foolishness to assume someone could question God and speak with him in a direct way. 
Despite this conversation, Job maintains his faith and continues to desire a connection with God. I'm taking my case straight to God Almighty. I've had it with you. I'm going directly to God. Your wise sayings are knick-knack wisdom, good for nothing but gathering dust. Job 13, verse 3, verse 12. At this point, Job begins a conversation with God. He pleads for understanding and asks the Lord for an explanation on the massive attack that has afflicted his life. Please, God, I have two requests. Grant them so I'll know I count with you. First, lay off the afflictions. The terror is too much for me. Second, address me directly so I can answer you or let me speak and then you answer me. How many sins have been charged against me? Show me the list. How bad is it? Why do you stay hidden and silent? Why treat me like I'm your enemy? Why kick me around like an old tin can? Why beat a dead horse? You compile a long list of mean things about me, even hold me accountable for the sins of my youth. You hobble me so I can't move about. You watch every move I make and brand me as a dangerous character. Like something rotten, human life fast decomposes. Like a moth-eaten shirt or a mildewed blouse. Job 13, verses 20 through 28. All of Job's pent-up frustrations come out in the open. In his mind, He's endured unfair circumstances. On top of this, his family and friends are not helping. Instead, everything they say contrasts what he believes. Job's friends continue to argue that he must be a sinner, but Job knows he is not a bad person despite the fact that bad things are happening to him. Ultimately, he is bewildered. Hope cannot be found in them or their explanations so he turns to the only person he knows will have answers. God Joyce's Story Back in my office, I asked Joyce, Where do you sense or feel Father God? Outside, she said. In the hallway. Okay, I said, then asked. What's the expression on his face? She looked at me with surprise and said, He's not angry. I expected him to be mad because, well, I just figured he'd be disappointed. Let's ask Father God some questions. Is that okay? Hesitating, Joyce said, Yes. First question. Does Father God believe the same way about you not wanting to be born? After repeating the prayer, Joyce shook her head. No. Okay, what does Father God think about it? Joyce repeated the prayer, then said, He doesn't agree with it because he created me. He wants me to be alive. What else is he saying? He says it hurts him to see me in pain. He wants me to know that he loves me and wants to be in a relationship with me. Joyce broke down in tears allowing Father God to hold her and rock her in his arms. Once she finished crying, Joyce looked at me with a peaceful expression, allowing her time for the process to sink in. I waited a few moments, then asked, The thought that you had about not being born, where is it now? It's gone, she said. How does that make you feel? Hopeful, she wipes her tear-streaming eyes. I'm excited to start a new journey with God and see what life could be like. The session ended soon after this with Joyce leaving my office, smiling and excited for life. After encountering the Lord in just a few moments, she stepped into a whole new world of healing. My story. I too remember a time when I said and felt what Job and Joyce were expressing. I was having similar thoughts of, Where's God, and why is all this happening? 
My childhood was one where I learned that life was not very safe, and it was better not to be around when adults were present. In truth, I actually remember very little about my childhood. As I became an adult, I began searching for the normal life. Venturing down this path, I discovered Christianity. In the churches I attended, leaders shared their interpretations of how to best live redeemed lives. This included going to church almost every day, being involved in activities the pastor suggested, and doing my best to be a religious woman, wife, and mother who could stay home and provide a stress-free environment for the kids. I tried to be my best self, an experience I thought that was indicated in the Bible. Yet I knew my experience, which was full of fear, anger, and frustration, was not like everybody else's. I didn't know how to do life other than what I already knew. Like Job, I felt I was doing the best I could, yet people kept telling me how broken I was. This led to both confusion and frustration. I knew there were wounds inside, but I kept trying to handle things alone. To make matters worse, when I tried to talk with people about my issues, nobody listened. In the midst of this turmoil, I began to wonder why I had ever been born, and why I was actually alive. If I had never existed from the beginning, then I wouldn't have had to deal with so many problems. I finally reached my end and decided I was finished with church and Christian culture. I was done hiding my anger at God. After voicing my misery, Father God stepped in and began some conversations with me. At first, I was not happy. I wanted him to give me answers and explain why my childhood had been so difficult. I needed to understand why my experience had been so different from others. What I needed was an explanation, but he wanted to give me affection and love, which actually made my anger worsen. Father God and I held some heated conversations back and forth. I wanted him to listen to my cries and change my circumstances. I needed him to do what I wanted. I remember one time when we were talking that I got so angry I started yelling at him about my past, my hurts, and life. I actually began kicking his shins and blaming him for all the issues that had occurred in my life. After I finished, God looked at me, took my face in his hands, and kissed me all over. I raged all the more. In all our debates, he never fixed or changed anything. He just continued to love me. In all this, he never got mad or punished me. To be honest, I actually expected some sort of rebuke. I had been told my entire life that it was sinful to be mad at God, and I could never come to him unless I was happy and ready to do everything he wanted. I desired and even expected punishment. Instead, he gave me affection. God continued to treat me with kindness. I eventually grew to see that what I needed was not answers to my problems, but someone to love me and be there for me no matter what. In all my times of yelling and complaints, God remained faithful and listened. I didn't realize it at first, but this eventually began to fill my empty bucket. I realized that finding answers did not have to be the driving force behind my happiness. I could allow him to show me love and give myself permission to be honest with him because I knew he would not get angry at how I expressed my feelings. I started going to God to tell him how I felt and what I thought, even when my feelings and thoughts were uncomfortable. When I waited for punishment to come, it never did. God did not change the people or situations around me, but he did slowly take care of me. Now when I am bothered by people or situations, I go to him. I avoid asking questions about my circumstances and instead ask how he plans to take care of me. Answers do not always come the way I want or in the preferred timing, but I have learned he will take care of me, which is actually what I always needed.